a couple of them. Check it out. All right. So, like, so God made all of these things, right? So one of the things we're looking at today and this week is what we can find out about God by the things that God does, right? So if we were to look at, let's, let's look at these three things together. What does God give the giraffe in creating the giraffe? A long neck so they can get to things up in the tree, right? Food, is yeah. that right, fam? And what do these little spots do? Is there a different, like for camouflage to make it harder for it to see? Or harder for people's things to see it, right? What things might see the giraffe that it wants to camouflage from? Boom! The lion, right? What does the lion do? What's the lion say? You know what the lion say? Roar! Right? The lion roars to show his kingship over the world. Roar! Right? So the, the God made the lion and the giraffe, and he gave the lion certain things that would allow the lion to rule over the giraffe, and, and if he needed to eat the giraffe, then he, he would eat the giraffe, etc. There's long legs, though, protect the, the giraffe from the lion. And then look at this elephant was also made by God, right? What, what does the elephant say? This is one of my favorite ones. <laughs> is that what the elephant says? <laughs> During COVID, you have to turn your head to do that one. Um, <laughs> so there is, there is a... The, God gives the elephant tusks to help protect him, and a long, trunky nose, right? What does the elephant do with his trunky nose? Drinks water. Drinks water. And sometimes he sprays himself with it to, to um, wash, him. wash him off. That's pretty neat, huh? Sure, to get That's pretty neat, huh? So where's another one? There's, is there a rhino in here? You got a rhino in here? I don't think so. There's also oh, there's a rhino. I think I remember from science class, not only was there a rhino, but there's also something called, I think it's a minor bird, that God gives a minor bird to live on the rhino's back and eat the bugs off the rhino's back. Isn't that kind of a neat thing? All of these little things that God does to take and care for these animals. Um, but, but it's also something interesting that God would create both animals that are predators and animals that are praised because there is something about the balance that God creates in life that it's not, it is um, a wonderful miracle to have all of these things in truth in, in this delicate balance. There's all kinds of cool animals in there, isn't there? Oh, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. It's a tiger. What's a tiger say? He says we are too, right? So we thank God for all of these animals and everything that we know about these animals, we can thank God for. And we can know something more about God by studying all of these animals and all of, what else did God make? God makes all of us. So if we get to know ourselves and get to know each other, we're also knowing God too. So let's thank God for everything that he has made. Dear God, thank you so much for sending all of these things, for creating this world that we live in, for creating us in it, and showing us your love and how it has many sides, um, both in protecting and providing for balance and cycles of life to continue. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, God. Oh, monkeys. What's a gorilla say? Ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Or does he just go, Urgh. He's saying, feed me. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come never wanted to share away from such things like predator and prey and all those children. <laughs> Very cute. Um, I was, 
when I was a kid in church growing up, when I was older than that age, I remember that there was a kid that was that age that would sit behind us and um, he was allowed to have trucks in church, which was amazing to me. So if I had thought about trucks, if I even pulled a truck out of my pocket, I might get pinched. Um, but it cracked me up because the 12 year old or 13 year old me would um, take him out and be boom, boom, boom. And, and in the middle of one of the great silences of church, all of a sudden you hear beep, beep. <laughs> oh, it was great. <laughs> it was so great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this world that you've made. Help us to grow closer to you as we seek to study it. Let us study each other, study the work of your hands that we may know you better. Um, may we in all things seek, seek you. It's in your Holy Spirit so that we, as we are studying and learning, that we might grow closer um, to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, so far I'm very excited about the way that the Lenten study is going. I hope that it can grow. Um, I think I was, in some ways, two years ago when we did it a little bit more, um, uh, had higher thoughts about where we could go and all of this kind of stuff. And, and so when it didn't necessarily totally reach that, you kind of felt like you, you know, there was more that you could do. This, my sets are, my, my sites are so much, not necessarily lower, but allowing it to just kind of be on its own and grow. And that, and that in itself might be a, um, um, an insight into my walk with God and, and where, where, you know, my comfort level is as, as we go through. Um, because the, the study really hasn't even begun yet, or hadn't begun yet until today. It's kind of the, we, on Ash Wednesday, we got together, some of us, and, and, and prayed, and blessed the journey, and thought about the journey. Um, and then in the study, it's just been introductory stuff. Today is when we get to the heart of it, where we start to ask that question of who is God, right? And, and we start to look to answer that question this week by looking at answering the question, who is God, by looking at what it is that God is doing. Next week, we'll look at what God says, and the week after that, we'll look at what people say about God. But today, it's all about the actions itself. Um, so this morning, I want to jump right in um, to one of the most lengthy descriptions about God and, his, and creation um, outside of Genesis. This is from Job. Um, Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 15. I could have actually included like three full chapters of this section if I wanted to. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther? Here is where your proud waves must halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, if we were... Judging God by what he says here, we might have a totally different take on this, right? We might get into the notion of sarcasm <laughs> and whatnot else because he's asking questions that he knows the answer to. The answer to Job's que to these questions of Job is not me, right? <laughs> have you done it? No, uh -uh, you do this, right? But instead, if we're looking at exactly what God does by the, this description, we can see a lot going on here. And God in this speech um, is looking at all of the things he does. And he claims also, if, if you keep going, 
the sea depths, the gates of death, the deepest darkness, the expanses of all the earth. He claims that all of these are his. He talks about snow and hail and lightning and winds and rain and thunderstorms and dew and ice and clouds and floods. He talks about giving wisdom to the ibis, that weird looking bird in Egypt. He talks about under, how he gives understanding to the rooster. Now he needs to give a little bit of understanding to my rooster because that rooster that we have needs to understand that I don't like him and he needs to leave me alone. And that when I go like this, he needs to run away, not stand up to me. He doesn't understand. God needs to give him a little bit of understanding. If not, my foot will. Now, he gives prey to the lioness, something that God does. He gives some... He gives to goats during the bearing of their children. He prescribes times for their births. He even gives grassland habitat for the wild donkey. It goes on and on to Job, talking about all of the works of his hands, describing in detail here what God means when we say that God is the creator. Not just of the heavens and earth, but of every single detail under the heavens and earth. And not just in things, but in processes of things. In the relationship between things. God has his hands in everything. From the biggest details of the heavens of earth, all the way to the smallest, like where the wild donkeys graze. I don't even know where wild donkeys live, let alone graze. All the details of childbirth for animals and human beings. The recreation of life and all of its intricacies. The fact that when a woman, a, a human woman, and, and all animals that are mammals, uh, uh, when, they, when human women become pregnant, they develop an organ within them that didn't exist before. Not just the human life, but the organ that sustains the human life. So in a sense, we can learn a lot about God by studying the world that he made and how it functions and all of its mysteries, right? Like the relationship of predator to prey, how life consumes other life to sustain itself, how natural disasters exist, hurricanes, tornadoes. How altering creation can have devastating effects, but also life-sustaining effects, right? The atom can be split for destruction, but also for energy. God created a system where the atom could be split for destruction and or energy. Also, more mundane mysteries like where does the platypus come from? Because here you have a beaver duck with a poisonous barb on his left ankle or back, whatever it is. A beaver duck. Another ancient mystery, like what does the fox say? <laughs> While we're at it, I've often wondered why seagulls who can fly wherever they want to, some seagulls live and prefer the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> they can fly anywhere. They can fly to luxurious habitats like the beach or like those marina golf clubs where people go to get married. Because you see seagulls there. How come there are some seagulls that fly there and other ones that hang out in the Walmart parking lot? <laughs> the poet William Cullen Bryant looked at a water bird like a seagull in his poem to a waterfowl, and he wondered about how it knew where it was going, right? He said, Whither midst the falling dew, while glow the heavens with the last steps of day. In other words, it's nighttime, it's about nighttime. Far through their rosy depths, dost thou pursue thy solitary way. Now, why is that bird flying off alone at night? But then he says, 
He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight in the long way that I must trace alone will lead my steps right. So he looks and says, because that bird knows where it's going and he's never been there before, I can go through my life and know where I'm going because I know that God is marking my path. It's a good thing for William Cullen Bryant that there were no Walmarts to mud up his description of waterfowls from back in the 1860s. So we can look at creation. And in that creation, we can, of course, also look to ourselves. What does our potential what we can be, what we can achieve. What does that say about God? Our divine spark, the idea that God made us all in his image. What does that say about God? Shakespeare asks this question in the voice of Hamlet. He says, what a piece of work is man, right? He says, how noble in his reason, how infinite in his faculty, his ability to do things. In form and moving, how express and admirable, how beautiful are we when we move. In action, how like an angel, in apprehension and what we hold off, how like a god. The beauty of the world as a human being, the paragon of animals. We're at the very tippy top. He almost sounds like Psalm 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them their um, rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds of the prey, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. But we read those two things and we can't forget reality. And Hamlet pulls us back and he says, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? In other words, what the heck is this? You know, we're supposed to be all this greatness. And I look around and all I see is a bunch of lumps of dust. Dirt bags. Dirt bags. <laughs> Dirt bags is a good, very good analogy. Human, the word human means of the dirt. Even the word Adam means man in Hebrew. It means of the dirt. So Greeks and Hebrews have the same concept of where human beings come from. The dirt. And about where human beings go to. The dirt. What are we to think about the amazing potential of human beings, but also the tremendous disappointment in the reality of human beings? Fear, worry, hate, violence, stupidity, herd mentality, need I go on? Because of course I can. War, terrorism, authoritarians, communists, people who drive in the left lane. <laughs> People, and I do that, <laughs> people who double dip their chips, people who don't return library books, people who don't return shopping carts, people who don't return phone calls and texts, people who allow their dreams to be squashed because they are afraid to fail, afraid to upset others, afraid to try something new. All of us, right? Amazing potential quintessence of dust. We think we might understand something about those seagulls a little bit better now, right? There's food here in this parking lot. Sure, it smells, but what better is there and what better could there be? But we could be chilling on a beach. Nah. Those places don't exist. You only hear about them. And if they did exist, how are we supposed to get there? And what about tomorrow? Because today, they're throwing out the leftover chicken tenders. 
<laughs> Those are just fairy tales. We, we want us to give up these chicken tenders for something else? We might stay here instead. How often do we see the things around us as limitations instead of reminders of what their existence might mean about what the promise of creation might be? A number of years ago, I wrote this called Night Lights about the idea of how our artificial light causes us not to be able to see the stars. When stars shine against darkness, shine in darkness, sparkling white against the night, it's a moment often missed, or oft times shadowed in the mist. Too much light can blur that far off twinkle, artificial lights blinding our eyes to the natural wonder of created gleaming. It's brighter beaming, but an eternity of way. At least seeming, because we cannot control what we have not made. Though we try, thinking if we just could, it would be better Truly made righteous, made just for us, by us, or at least me. I can't speak for others. And so many opinions there would be on just how it should be, what perfect could be, if we could just agree. Maybe that is why he who made the sky, made all things, all rules, all decisions, for only he knows the hearts of all, the dreams we all seem to find in the sky, hidden behind the gleaming of our artificial light's own beaming. If you find yourself completely surrounded by artificial light, it is entirely difficult to find anything beyond it. If you surround yourself with the things that are made by human beings, it is impossible or hard to see anything beyond what we are forming with our own hands. There is a lot, there is much, that we can learn and think about in terms of who God is. If we were to look at the world he created it, created, knowing that he created it. That, yes, and that, and that, and that, and this, and that. Right? But of course, God, God's action isn't finished with just creating. God does more. We see God doing much more in the Bible than just creating. On the kids' color page, I have six things that God does, right? God creates, God forgives, God delivers, God provides, God protects, and God loves. We think about those. Creates and provides, we've kind of talked about. Protects, though. Think about all the stories about protection in the Bible. On the ark, in the basket for Moses, which is actually called an ark in Hebrew as well. How cool is that? In the desert, in exile, in the lion's den, in the fiery furnace, in the belly of the great fish. God protects. It's also captured in the 23rd Psalm. The shepherd protects. The Lord is my shepherd. Have you ever felt God's protection at any point in your life. Next, God delivers. Noah out of the flood safely to shore, the Israelites out of Egypt and all the bondage to that land of milk and honey through the desert. Joseph throughout his life. Ruth throughout her life. Esther in hers. Jacob in his. Abraham in his. Every single example of any character that you'll find in the Bible, you will see the shades and the handwork of God's the deliverer. It's the same question. Have you seen God, experienced God delivering you in your own life? Set safely to shore, carried through something, through the fire, through disease, through struggle, through heartache, through divorce, through loss, saved from the situation of your own making sometimes, it seems. What about God forgives? How often in the Bible do we see God forgiving? And it's not just in the New Testament. You actually look for the word forgive. In both the New Testament and the Old Testament, the number is almost equal. The word forgive is there 59 times in the New Testament. It's there 58 times in the Old Testament. 
It's there most often, I think, in the cycle that we see in Judges, right? The people move towards God because they are lost somehow. God helps them. God saves them. God forgives them. They turn away only to end up in ruin. God sends another deliverer that delivers them out. They fall away, go back, etc. It happens again and again and again and again and again. We can see it out of the book of Judges through the rest of the Bible. We can look back through history and see the same exact patterns happening again and again through life and history. We can probably look back at our own lives and see that cycle happening also. Can you? If you can, that's God forgiving. God destroys. I didn't put that one on the coloring sheet. But it is the last day of this week's discussion is about that exact thing. God destroys. And if you don't think God the destroyer exists, think about Saul and his kingship. Think about Jericho. Think about Pharaoh's army. Think about Jerusalem. Think about God's own temple. Nowhere else in ancient religion does this happen. Usually what happens when a temple is destroyed in ancient times is the religion goes away too. The God has seemed to be one of two things. He is either non-existent or he is weak compared to the new gods that are coming to town with the big army. Never in the history of the world other than this is do you find a temple destroyed and God growing stronger outside of the temple because he transcends the temple. And if you read the prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and the parts where they're talking about destruction, he takes credit for his own destruction of that temple. I destroyed that. So they will know that I am the Lord. Not so my temple exists forever and they'll know that my name is Lord. I'm going to destroy my own temple. So before we seek to make God a cuddly little teddy bear, we need to make sure that we're seeing the entire picture as well. But these aren't the only actions of God. All of the actions of God don't fit nicely into the little categories. What about this one? What about God marking Cain? Cain has just destroyed Abel, just killed his own brother. He says, but God, he, he's been sent out. I said, but God, they will all make fun of me. They will all kill me. They will all hurt me. They will all whatever. I will put my mark on you so that no one will lay a hand on you. Now, you still got to go. You're still getting the boot. But there's some level of protection still upon even Cain. What about God hardening the heart of Pharaoh? It's an action in the Bible. What about God having Abraham, Abraham sacrifice Isaac only to stop him at the last minute? The Bible is full of these stories where we see God acting and they each give us a glimpse into the person and into the heart of God. But none of them in their own, on their own, give us the full picture. We need the full picture. And we can't ignore or shave off any of the parts that we don't like. We need to look at God not from who we think he is and shape him based on our perceptions, but to think about God and the objectivity of who God is despite us first. Who, who God is outside of our expectations and outside of our needs and outside of all those things. Because he, filled that, he fills that space too. And one of the most beautiful things about thinking of God in this way is that the person sitting next to you has different needs, feelings, emotions, thoughts about God. Different ones. And if you only see God through your own vision, how could you ever expect to understand somebody else's? Our lives give us glimpses into the heart of God.
God. Looking back on your life, do you see the patterns akin in the Bible? God creating, God providing, God delivering, God destroying. Can you put yourself in the seat of the person next to you and think about how God has been all of those things for them as well? And more. And differently. I am leaving out a very important action of God. Perhaps the most important. In that, it provides some clarity and inform so much about how we might actually see the rest. I was going to do John 3.16. Someone on the discussion board said, and I agreed, that John 3.17 should also be always included. And then have, as I was looking... I thought probably 18, 19, 20, and 21 should be included as well. And so here we are. For God so loved the world that he gave. <clears throat> His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God not sin, did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him um, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This, this also is the word of the Lord. Glory be to God. So that informs all of these questions as well. And that is very much an action of God. Giving of his only son, but also being that only son and walking through that death on the cross and the resurrection himself. You think, in a world where this is true about the Creator, why would anybody hang out in a Walmart parking lot? When they could instead fly. <clears throat> May you see that metaphor anyway that it helps you the most. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see the world that you have made and the world that we live in. Help us to see that they are the same. Help us to see the struggles and the pain and the challenges that we face as you drawing us closer, as you filling our hearts with grace. May that grace overflow through each moment to give us opportunities to extend that grace beyond ourselves to each other. You command us to love and not only that, through your actions, you show us what love is. Love that does not remove standards, but believes in justice. Love that also forgives, giving a chance and second chance and third chance and 77 chance to get over that bar without taking that bar down. That love sacrifices of itself for others. That love seeks to build up the other by always setting them free. 
rather than imposing upon them chains and slavery. Help us to see you, God, delivering us through those things that we are afraid of so that anything that we are afraid of does not bind us in fear, but sets us free to walk arm in arm with you through it. We pray with people who are in darkness, whether that darkness is caused by loss or sickness or doubt or catastrophe, not getting a fair shake, whatever it may be. Give us the strength to walk through those situations faithfully, knowing that you are with us and have not forsaken us at any point. Help us when we choose something other than you And give us the chance to fix that very problem each time and every time. Send your Son into our lives again that we may be saved through his crucifixion and resurrection. And may we learn to pray and believe through the words he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As I was um, putting together this sermon and this week, I could not think of any better outline for myself than this hymn, How Great Thou Art. May we sing it together.